All right, it looks like it's seven o'clock, so I think we should probably get started. Uh, all right, happy Wednesday, everyone. Uh, my name is Rich Capitan. I'm the Education Director at the Alaska Zoo, and welcome to our Wildlife Wednesday lecture series. Uh, the last Wednesday of the month. I can't believe it's almost April. That's crazy, but it's awesome. Um, I want to thank very quickly our sponsors that make uh, this lecture series happen. Of course, we want to thank the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Fisheries, the National Park Service, Alaska Conservation Foundation, Projects in Motion, and Alaska Geographic. Um, be watching the chat uh, throughout this evening's presentation as I will be dropping a 10% discount code um, for the Alaska Geographic store. And I will put the uh, discount code migrations for a 10% discount um, in their store. Also, I will be uh, pulling the lucky name of someone uh, who's joining us tonight for a bird related gift bag provided by Alaska Geographic. So a uh, big shout to all of our sponsors for making this happen. Uh, tonight, uh, I'm very excited because I'm a bit of a bird nerd uh, and uh, I love shorebirds. Uh, I definitely want to introduce tonight uh, Laura McDuffie. Um, she's going to be presenting her master's thesis research on the migratory movements and harvest exposure risk of the lesser yellow legs. Uh, the lesser yellow legs population has experienced a steep decline since the 1970s, uh, and Laura will discuss some likely causes. Additionally, Laura will present the results of her research, which involved the use of GPS satellite transmitters to track the movements of birds across the Western Hemisphere. So without further ado, uh, let's give a big uh, welcome to Laura McDuffie. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I am actually currently a biologist and data scientist with USGS, um, but I was working for US Fish and Wildlife Service while I was doing this research. Um, so all the results I'm going to talk to you about tonight um, was actually yeah, part of my master's research, which I completed through at the University of Alaska Anchorage, um, just finished up, I guess, a year ago now. Um, so this research definitely would not have been made possible without all these various support is supporters listed down here on the bottom. So it was a massive collaboration um, from agencies and universities across Alaska and Canada, as well as other parts of the United States. So I can advance my slide, there we go. So the lesser yellow legs is part of the Scolopacidae family, which includes the sandpipers, snipe, turnstones, and curlews. And so the lesser yellow legs is actually considered a sandpiper. And the name sandpiper comes from their call rather than those long bills, which some people might think that's where the name comes from, but it doesn't. It's their call. So depending on where you're located, the lesser yellow legs may be called many different names. So English, they're lesser yellow legs. Um, in French, they're called small knights. Uh, in Spanish, they're called the small-legged red shank. And then here in Alaska, the one that is really good at greeting you. So that sound in the background is a lesser yellow legs call. And they will call nonstop until you leave. So I'm sure if you've been to Potter Marsh or um, any, any of the wetlands around town, you've definitely heard the yellow legs. They can find you from a mile away. So <laughs> they're, they're definitely pretty loud. So the lesser yellow eggs is eight inches tall. And on average, they weigh about the same as a medium sized tangerine. So 88 grams. Um, but we've seen them um, anywhere from 70 grams all the way up to 110 grams. So there's quite a range in size. So the lesser yellow eggs are habitat generalists on their breeding grounds. And so they breed in the boreal biome, which is this green polygon here. So it covers Alaska and all of Canada. And so this is kind of what a, the boreal uh, wetlands look like that they breed in. Um, but they will nest in a variety of different habitats from open woodlands and meadows to spruce bogs like this picture here 
as well as even urbanized habitats. Um, and they always nest on the ground in a shallow depression that's either um, naturally made or that they make themselves. And so in Anchorage, Alaska, where um, most of my research was conducted, um, birds were found nesting in a variety of habitats. So this is a power line clearing. So that star right there indicates where there's an actual nest. This is the old recycling center out by the coastal refuge. There's a nest right there. And then this is just a boreal wetland. That's actually a, an adult incubating a nest right there. Um, so yes, they can be in a variety of different locations. Um, and lesser yellow can move extraordinary distances between their nesting sites and their foraging locations, um, even within just a small area. So um, in Anchorage during the late 1990s, uh, Lee Tibbetts, who also works for USGS, uh, she described some adult lesser yellow legs taking their chicks through people's yards and across busy roads just to reach foraging locations down here on the coastal refuge. So to orient, orient yourself a little bit, this is um, Stork Park up here, um, Bear Valley's up this direction. And then Potter's Marsh is actually right down here and Ocean View. So they can travel pretty far distances with their chicks. Um, but lesser yellows have a very large range across Alaska and they're definitely commonly observed in the Anchorage area. So all of these points indicate locations where lesser yellows have been recorded um, using eBird, which is a citizen science database, um, if you haven't heard of it before. And so the species is common here from April until about September. Um, breeding adults start arriving in late April and the birds that you may be seeing in September, those are actually the chicks that have grown up to become juveniles. Um, the adults tend to leave between June and July. So, so the chicks hang around uh, later into the year. And then on their non-breeding grounds, they are also habitat generalists, just like other breeding grounds. Um, so in, in, during, the, um, during the boreal winter, so our winter, they head down to uh, South America and Central America and the Caribbean. And they uh, tend to use coastlines, um, so beaches and mudflats, as well as estuaries and rivers and lakes as well as flooded agriculture and rangeland. Um, so this picture here is actually taken by a colleague. Um, it's a flooded pasture in Guatemala, and there were quite a few lesser yellow legs using this, this pond to forage in. So in terms of their food preference, they are omnivores. They like to eat both plants and animal products, um, but mostly they consume flies and snails and beetles and dragonflies, um, but they will occasionally eat fish and even grains. So this video here uh, is actually uh, some lesser yellow eggs foraging um, near Isleson Air Force Base um, near Fairbanks. Just a short video. All right, so now that you understand some of the basics of the species life history, um, you may ask yourself, why should you care about lesser yellow legs? Well, it's because the seemingly numerous species has and continues to experience a very steep population decline. So nearly all shorebirds that breed in North America are experiencing some sort of population decline, but the lesser yellow legs have experienced a very steep decline uh, between 63 to 70% just since the 1970s. And this data is based on the North American shorebird surveys, as well as ro road-based um, BBS surveys or breeding bird surveys. And then within just Alaska, the annual decline in the Northwestern interior forest, um, which encompasses the majority of the species breeding range within Alaska, um, the decline is estimated at 5.3 to 9.2% annually. And so decades ago, the population estimate was probably well over 1.1 million birds. But with the steep decline, the current estimate is at about 400,000 total. 
So the, there's this database called the Avian Conservation Assessment Database, or ACAD, and it was established by Partners in Flight, and it provides this conservation assessment and ranking system for all of North American bird species. So a species is ranked following this species prioritization matrix, and it includes these three different conservation metrics. So there's vulnerability, meaning uh, is the species on a watch list currently? Uh, decline, has the species population declined by greater than 50%? And then there's this urgency metric, which I have in red here. And that you can kind of think of this like half-life. So it's basically how long into the future will it take a population to lose an additional 50% of its population? So for the lesser yellow legs, this urgency metric is pretty startling. So it predicts that the species will be reduced by um, an additional 58% within just the next 11 years. And so the lesser yellow legs is a priority species for conservation because of its high concern based on those three different metrics. So the causes of decline are definitely really quite complex and they're somewhat interrelated. Um, but some of these threats include habitat loss. Um, so this includes deforestation, agriculture and rangeland intensification, urbanization, um, as well as wetland filling and drying. Um, and then agrochemical application, that's another one that we don't, we don't fully understand, um, but agrochemicals are like pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and those are used to prevent damage to crops, obviously, but they can also leach into the soil as well as the groundwater and um, run off into ponds nearby where lesser yellows are foraging. So they can definitely ingest some of those, um, those pesticides and herbicides. And this last one is unregulated harvest. So this is actually a pretty recently discovered threat, but the lesser yellows is the most frequently harvested shorebird species in the Caribbean and Northeastern South America. And so the research on the species really began, began because I had this, um, this desire to try to understand how the lesser yellow is impacted by harvest as well as other potential threats. Um, so I really wanted to try to identify appropriate management actions to try to stabilize the, the species decline. So we know obviously that the species is, is in decline, but we really want to know how and where geographically bottlenecks are occurring for this species. So if you are familiar with this term of bottleneck, it's basically um, a sharp reduction in the size of a population. And this can be due to environmental events such as earthquakes or floods or fires. Um, it could be due to disease droughts, even human activities. So um, kind of asking ourselves, where are these bottlenecks occurring? So I'm just gonna point out some areas. So in Alaska, maybe um, one of the bottlenecks uh, is this threat of wetland drying. So with permafrost thaw, some of these wetlands are, are draining basically. And so they're, the lesser yellows are losing their habitats. Um, in the prairie pothole region of, of Canada and the U.S., um, maybe they are exposed to agrochemicals, like I just previously mentioned. Uh, maybe along the east coast of the United States, um, they are influenced by urbanization and habitat loss. And the Guianas, maybe it's unregulated harvest that's, that's causing the, the major decline here. And then in Argentina, maybe it's the, the rangeland intensification that's going on the, in that area. Um, there's definitely quite a few cattle um, and all of the, the runoff basically from their, their feces can cause harmful alg algal blooms um, in nearby waterways. Um, so that definitely can be a threat to the species as well, since they tend to hang out in wetlands. 
All right, so how do scientists actually determine where these bottlenecks may be occurring? Well, we track birds. So this, this bird here, this photo was taken in Churchill, Manitoba, which is one of our study sites. And as you can see here, it is wearing a GPS transmitter. So you can barely see the feathers here on its back that are just puffed up a little bit, but that's where the main body of the tag is and that has this long antenna. So you can definitely tell when they're wearing these transmitters. Um, so this study included birds tracked from seven ge geographically uh, distinct breeding populations. Um, so we tracked a total of 118 birds between 2018 and 2021. And so the value next to each location is the total number of birds tracked in all of those years. Um, so in total, there were 59 females, 50 males, and then nine that were um, an unknown sex. So we definitely covered a large area of their breeding range, which was excellent. So the first step in trying to reach our objectives of understanding these declines and their threats was to actually search for and monitor nests. Um, so we needed to be able to locate um, breeding pairs of these birds. So nest searching involved many, many, many hours of watching birds' behaviors. So some nests were actually relatively easy to find. I think last summer I found one in five minutes, which is unheard of um, because the majority take about two consecutive days of just sitting and watching a pair to try to figure out where they're nesting. Um, but once we did find these nests, we monitor them with temperature loggers. So this photo here, this little black dot, that's actually a little temperature probe. And, and this is the, the wire that goes to it. Um, and that uh, is able to tell us that when the bird is actually, the adult is actually incubating the nest or when it is maybe off foraging and the eggs are left alone. Um, and then this other, so that's that one. And then this here, we put up these game cameras next to nests. And so we were able to monitor the time of day when birds were returning to nests. So you could just barely see the movement back there. So they're definitely very well hidden. So um, once these nests hatch, hatched, then we were able to more easily capture the adults and then put those GPS transmitters on them. Um, so we used two, two different techniques for capturing these birds. Um, we used the flip net method and then the vertical mist net method. And with both of these, we played recordings of chip calls, and that was the way that we attracted the adults to the net. So here's a each one. Sorry, it's a little loud. So we catch the bird and then we try to get to it as quick as we can and get it out of the net. And it doesn't harm them at all. And then this net is um, just stationary on the ground. And then we, of course, try to run over and get them out as quick as we can as well. All right, so once we have the birds in hand, um, we band each individual with a USGS metal band, a color band that corresponds to the actual study location. So it's kind of hard to see, see, but in Anchorage, we use this dark green color. So each bird had a dark green band. Um, we also gave them these engraved leg flags that had a unique letter combination. So normally they just have two different letters, but that way we can tell individuals apart because without that, they all look exactly the same. Um, so after banding, then we collected the basic measurements. Um, so tarsus length, that's what this picture is showing here. So basically the length of their, their leg. Um, we also collected the length of their bill, their wing length, uh, their total body mass. We also collected blood samples, and that was to be able to identify sex. So in the field, it's very difficult to um, figure out who's male and who's female. 
And then finally, our last step was to attach that GPS tag. And so we used one millimeter, so very thin, stretchy jewelry cord, actually. And so you can kind of think of it um, like the shape of a butterfly. So the body of the butterfly is the actual tag, and then these loops um, are the way that we attach it to the bird. So we actually take those loops and put them around the leg of the bird, and it sits right in the nice little you know, socket there, and they stay in place. So they're called leg loop harnesses. And these types of GPS tags had never been used on the species before my um, study. And so I was definitely worried. I wasn't sure if they were going to work or not, but luckily they did. And wearing the tags definitely did not hurt their voices. They did just fine with them. They were able to fly just fine and they were acting completely normal. So that was great to see. All right, so now I'm going to introduce you to several birds that were tracked for a full year. So that's from breeding location and then all the way back to their breeding location again. And so I'm going to describe some of the threats that they may have potentially encountered during their migration. And this photo here, of course, is an adult lesser yellow legs. And this is its chick right here, which is about three days old, we estimate. All right, so P.E. from Canudi National Wildlife Refuge. So he was tracked between 2019 and 2020, and he weighed 79 grams and traveled a total distance of 19,865 kilometers, which is equivalent to 12,343 miles. So he traveled that far in just one single year. So he departed Canudi on July 3rd of 2019 and arrived in Forestburg, Alberta on the 21st and stayed there all the way through August 14th, so for four, four full weeks. But then after just a four-day migration, he arrived in Cypress Quarters, Florida, and then crossed the Caribbean um, and arrived in Ecuador on September 11th. And that was his chosen wintering location, it appeared. And so he remained there through April 14th, so about eight full months. And then on April 25th, we detected him in Dean, Iowa, where he was only there for about five days, and then traveled all the way back to Canudi and made it back by May 15th. So in total, autumn migration took about three months and spring migration was only about one month. So pretty, pretty quick. So some of the possible threats to this bird. So in Alberta, there's definitely agriculture, coal mining, oil and gas production. Um, so agricultural practices are pretty common in most of these regions as well as urbanization. Um, so each of these regions within the Western Hemisphere des definitely have potential threats to shorebirds, um, but P PE did stop in a lot of these areas that are rich in agriculture. So um, agrochemical, agrochemical exposure, um, as well as habitat loss from these agricultural practices, that was likely the most significant threat to this individual, um, at least during that one single mi migratory year. All right, so then here is MP. This bird was tracked from Anchorage. We actually um, captured her out on J Bear, so the military base here in town. And she weighed a whopping 98.6 grams, which was very large. And she traveled 27,374 kilometers or 17,009 miles in one year. So she departed Anchorage on June 26th of 2019 and then arrived in Grand Prairie on July 2nd and only stayed there through July 6th before moving on to North Dakota. Um, but she stayed there through July 26th, so just a bit longer. And then next she went straight down to Florida and uh, she spent two weeks there um, before heading over to Columbia. Um, she stayed there for 
a short amount of time before deciding to head all the way down to Argentina, where she remained for the full winter um, period. Um, on the way back, there are very short duration stops, um, so I don't have that um, I don't have any actual locations of where she remained for a long period of time. It seemed like it took her not very long to get back um, up to Anchorage. So um, it took, yeah, about three months again for auto migration and a month or less um, to get back to Anchorage. So very quick. So these areas have very similar um, types of potential threats. But if you notice in Florida and Columbia, she actually was within a wildlife management area in Florida. And in Columbia, this area where she was hanging out um, was very popular with ecotourism, especially for bird watchers. Um, so the exposure to agricultural practices and agrochemicals definitely was a potential threat. Um, but also because she utilized those wildlife management areas, um, which are actually designated protected areas, um, that probably was, was pretty safe for her. All right, and then just one more we're going to go through. So Churchill, Manitoba. So A71 was tracked between 2019 and 2020, and this is a female that weighed 88 grams and traveled 26,334 kilometers or 16,363 miles. So just a little bit shorter than Anchorage, that last Anchorage bird. All right, so she, uh, she departed on July 11th of 2019 and then arrived in central Manitoba. She didn't go too far and remained there through August 6th. Then she moved very quickly all the way across the Atlantic. So these are actual locations, GPS locations. So very far out into the ocean, um, but she arrived in Suriname by August 20th and then moved on to Brazil, where she had a pretty short duration stop before moving down to Argentina. And you can see there's, there was a lot of movement going on here. So she really liked to, to travel um, some distance during winter. Didn't really want to rest in one location. Um, and then on the way back north, we detected her in Kansas for a very short period of time before she arrived back in Churchill. Um, on May 27th. And so she took again three months for autumn migration and about one month for, for spring migration. And some of the possible threats again are similar, but the interesting th thing about this bird is that she actually was potentially exposed to shorebird harvest. Obviously she uh, is, was still alive for the full year, so she did not succumb to harvest, but there is definitely the potential there. Um, but again, a lot of ranching and mining and agricultural practices going on in these areas. So there's a variety of different threats she could have been exposed to. All right, so back to this main question of where these bottlenecks occur. So this map here shows track lines from all those different birds. So it's pretty overwhelming to look at. But when you look beyond the individual and you look at this, um, you can kind of see patterns start to emerge. Um, so the first step was try to explore different regions where we're seeing a lot of overlap. So this first one, this is the prairie pothole region. And we're seeing individuals coming from all these different populations. Um, even if they're kind of, even if they're going west, they're still going to this region. Um, and so we're, we, we really want to explore and see huh, what's going on in this area. So last summer was a pilot year to try to identify if pesticide exposure of lesser yellows is a real threat. And so there's a new graduate student working on that project. Um, she'll be out there again this coming summer. Um, so definitely look forward to hearing um, what she finds out there. Uh, then we see that there were a lot of birds that um, flew across the Atlantic and made landfall in the Caribbean and the Guianas. 
And that's where a lot of this unregulated harvest occurs. Um, so this is actually the main focus of my master's thesis. So I'm gonna actually go into more detail about that in a second. Um, but I'm gonna, there's this, this, there's this third reason, region, uh, which is central Argentina. And down there, we had birds from all the various populations going down there. So we wanted to see, hmm, what's, what's happening? <laughs> So we have some partners that, that actually live and work down there and they're conducting um, surveys during the non-breeding period to try to identify abundance as well as to try to actually um, recite, excuse me, recite some of our birds that we've tagged um, in North America. All right, so my master's thesis, like I just said, was the focused on unregulated harvest. So not all the lesser yale eggs that were tracked um, within a harvest zone were potentially exposed. I mean, it's hard to really say, um, but it doesn't mean that it's not potentially a real threat. Um, so to give you a little bit better idea of where harvest is most likely occurring, um, it's kind of hard to see. Um, but these countries out, outlined in red in the Caribbean, those are countries where harvest most likely occurs. And then it occurs mostly along the coastlines of um, Guyana, Suriname, French Guiana, and then Brazil here. So this here is a table of estimated annual harvest values for shorebirds. Um, as well as lesser yellow legs. So this is all shorebirds and this is just lesser yellow legs. And so it's really important first to note that the majority of harvest occurs during autumn. Um, so that's July through October. So that's, that's when the majority occurs. So these numbers aren't necessarily for an entire year. Um, and then this far right column here, this ind indicates the percentage of lesser yellow eggs that are harvested within that total shorebird harvest estimate. And this is per each of these different jurisdictions. Um, and then this here, the high and low, that's basically the confidence score. Um, so estimating harvest can be really difficult. So it's mostly based on surveys, hunter surveys, as well as reporting. Um, but hunting is legal in many areas or illegal in many areas. And people don't want to say if they're hunting or not. But even if in areas where it is legal, hunters still don't really want to participate and tell authorities how many birds they've been hunting or where they've been hunting. So it's really, it can be really difficult to get an idea of actual harvest. Um, but it's definitely clear the harvest does occur, and it's really important to try to understand whether birds from certain breeding populations are disproportionately exposed to harvest. So the birds that are breeding in eastern Canada, are they more likely to be exposed than, say, birds breeding in Anchorage? All right, so these next few figures, this is from um, my thesis and recent manuscript that was just published. Um, so this is basically showing the proportion of individuals that entered a harvest region. Um, so that from, so if we kind of go in this S pattern, this is Anchorage, and then we go east down all the way to Mingan. Um, we just started tracking the birds from Isleson relatively recently, so they weren't included in the study. So that's why you're not seeing them here. Um, but as a general pattern, we're definitely seeing that the um, number of individuals occurring within these harvest regions increases as you move from west to east. So Anchorage, we did see a couple enter that area, but it de definitely increased. Um, whereas Mingan, all 100% of those individuals entered one of those zones. So this figure here shows the probability of a randomly selected individual from each population occurring in any harvest exposure zone or outside of a zone. So what we found is that the James Bay and Mingan population, which um, I combined into e just Eastern Canada, um, it had the highest probability of occurrence from about mid-August 
through October at this peak, um, whereas the Anchorage and Canudi, which is this Alaska population, um, it was basically just flatlined down here at the bottom. You can barely see it. And I definitely also saw that there was a temporal difference in peak occurrence. So temporal meaning time. So in Churchill, the peak was somewhere here in mid-August, whereas it was just slightly later for the Eastern Canada population. And it's really important to understand the timing um, of occurrence in each of these zones um, because the harvest doesn't occur at the same time in each region. So in some countries or jurisdictions, there's open and closed seasons. Um, so the, the risk can definitely fluctuate. Um, a good example of this in Barbados, the open season runs from the 15th of July through the 15th of October. So if a bird was present in that country, um, it potentially had a higher likelihood of being harvested than say if it was there in December when harvest is not legal. All right, and this figure shows the probability of a randomly selected individual from each population um, occurring uh, in each harvest exposure zone. So really what this shows is that in, for the Anchorage and Canudi population and the Yellowknife population, um, they occurred in the Caribbean and the Guianas, whereas Churchill, there were individuals that occurred in all three of those zones. And then the James Bay of Mingan, which is that Eastern Canada population, they were only occurring within the Guianas in Brazil and not the Caribbean. Um, but again, the timing of possible exposure, um, that's definitely key here to understand. So there was some evidence of harvest. So fortunately, or unfortunately, I don't know <laughs> which, but um, because we have strong collaborations with the biologists that are working with the Caribbean hunters, um, we were actually able to receive some shorebird harvest reports. Um, and specifically of tagged birds. So in fall of 2020, we, re we received information about two tagged birds that were harvested in that same year. So 02A was banded in Yellowknife and was harvested in Guadeloupe on August 15th of 2020. And A65 was banded in Churchill and was harvested in Martinique on September 4th of 2020. So this is the track line for A65 for the year prior to harvest. And so it looks pretty typical to other shorebirds um, that I, well, the other individuals that I went through previously. This bird also traveled way out into the Atlantic and, and went through all these areas. And it's hard to see here, but it actually did not occur in any of these harvest exposure zones. It's actually in Venezuela right here, which they do not tend to participate in shorebird harvest. Um, so both of the birds actually completed full annual migratory cycles prior to being harvested. But the interesting thing is that neither of those birds were detected in the Caribbean in 2019, which is the location of Guadeloupe and Martinique. So this suggests that there may be some variation in pathways between years, even for the same individuals. And I mean, the reason for this, we don't really know, but it could be due to weather, maybe changes in food resources, but there's definitely some variation going on. But shorebird harvest is a cultural practice. It's been around for thousands of years in these regions. Um, and it's, I mean, it's common in the Caribbean and Northeastern South America, and even in rural Alaska, there's definitely some harvest going on of these shorebirds. Um, and so, for example, in Martinique, this is a nice picture of one of the swamps in Martinique. Um, they, their harvest season is open for 205 days between July and February. And shorebird species, um, they can be legally harvested um, during that time, of course, with minimal, minimal restrictions. But recently, they actually implemented bag limits. So they have a limit on the number of birds or shorebirds you can harvest for at least the large species, such as the Wimbrel and the Hudsonian Godwit. They've also started implementing hunter log books. Um, those are definitely being enforced so they can actually um, have a better understanding of how many shorebirds are being harvested and that information can be used for um, 
you know, conservation of the species or understanding how the, the population's doing. So by beginning to establish these harvest regulations, several countries like Martinique, as well as Barbados, that's another good example, they're definitely doing their part to help ensure the well-being of migratory shorebirds. And so when a species is properly managed, it actually ensures that that bird will be around for future generations for traditional harvest. So they can continue to harvest these species um, because it is a tradition, but we just want to make sure that it's, it's regulated. All right, so some take-home messages. First off, migratory routes are unique, um, yet potential threats are pretty similar. We are seeing birds going all over the place, but they are all exposed to the same potential threats. Um, also, lesser yellings definitely do not observe political boundaries. Um, an individual lesser yellings can cover long, long distances in a single year and can move through dozens of different countries in their lifetime. And then lastly, the inclusion of social science, co-production, and communication are really critical components in the development of conservation action plans for the species. So because the, the species is a long-distance migrant and occurs in many different countries, it's really critical to try to devise some sort of conservation plan through a coordinated and strategic effort. Um, we want to make sure that individuals from all these different countries are involved and not just one, one country. Um, and definitely awareness and education can go a long way. So when people um, have a better understanding of the threats that the species face, they're more likely to try to do something about it or um, or educate others as well. Um, so how can you take action just in general for any bird species? Um, you've probably seen this graphic before. Uh, so Cornell Lab of Ornithology put this out. So there's seven, seven simple actions, which include drinking bird-friendly, shade-grown coffee, participating in citizen science programs like Birds and Bogs in Alaska, um, put those nice little window decals all over your window so birds see, see the windows and they don't hit them. Uh, it's definitely pretty common when people have feeders near their, near their windows. Um, either keep your cats inside or build a nice fancy catio like this, like this picture shows. Um, and then use natural and her homemade insecticides. So don't need to purchase um, the, the toxic chemicals. Use something that's safe for wildlife. And then again, education and awareness can, can go a long way. So just share your experiences. All right, so funding for this project was through various means. Um, Actually, the Department of Defense um, funded the majority of this, so we definitely thank them for that, as well as Alaska Fish and Game, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the Churchill Northern Studies Center. They provided vehicles and a place for scientists to stay while working in Churchill. And then Environment and Climate Change Canada was definitely instrumental in providing um, biologists and um, helping with logistical support for trying to get to different regions across Canada. Uh, so again, here are all the collaborators. Definitely could not have done this without all of them. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for listening. And I can take any questions you might have now. Um, if you think of some later, feel free to email me. My email is down here. So yeah, thanks so much. Awesome, Laura. Thank you uh, so much. So if you have any questions, yeah, please put them in the comments or in the chat, and uh, uh, we will get those questions and uh, get them to Laura uh, ASAP. So I was just Googling some info. One of your graphics said that the birds weigh about 88 grams. Was that correct? Average, yeah. Average. So I was like, what, you know, what weighs 88 grams? Uh, a tennis ball is about 57 grams. Uh, a C battery? 65 grams a deck of cards 94 grams it's just amazing to me that these birds can fly that far in fact if you didn't have the data with the actual gps locators i wouldn't believe it like you hear these things about like the the hudsonian godwits flying to new zealand it's an it's just and the bar-tailed godwits <laughs> the bar-tailed godwits right yeah. 
uh, these little tiny birds fly literally across the planet and it's nuts. <laughs> it is. All right, I see a question here. Uh, it says, birds take longer traveling south than north. Are they getting a tailwind going north? That's a good question. I did not look at wind speed or wind direction, which definitely would be really interesting to look at. Um, but I think overall, so once they um, are up, say in Alaska, breeding, nesting, they raise their chicks, they're pretty depleted in terms, in terms of like fat reserves. So as they're moving along, going south, they're definitely stop, stopping for longer periods of time um, at different locations and trying to, to build up those fat reserves a little bit before flying another, another thousand kilometers and stopping again. So they're not building up a lot of fat, sometimes not at all at locations, but they're definitely trying to, yeah, they slow down a little bit and try to make sure that they can make it the whole way. <laughs> Um, somebody asks, uh, oops, I just lost it here. Uh, what percentage of birds banded make it round trip? Good question. So there's going to be a whole nother paper out about that. Um, <laughs> but so I'm trying to think off the top of my head. It was, it was definitely less than 50%, but more than a quarter. But the difficult thing is, um, these birds do have pretty high site fidelity, fidelity, meaning that they return to the same breeding location each year, generally. But we did detect some birds that actually bred across the inlet, Susitna Flats, as well as on the Kenai. And these GPS tag batteries don't really last more than a year if you're lucky. So these birds could have returned to Alaska. We just weren't able to detect them because the batteries weren't working and we weren't in those locations. So um, the birds that did return seemed to be doing very well. Um, so yeah, it's really hard to say. <laughs> it's really hard to say. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody asks, uh, why do people take these birds and what do they do with them? So in terms of, of harvesting, um, so it's definitely a traditional practice, like I mentioned. So, so for subsistence, um, it's also a source of income for some low-income um, communities. It's considered a delicacy. So I didn't actually show the picture in this, but you only get about like a quarter size of meat off of these birds. So it's not very much, um, but apparently they are very tasty. So it's a delicacy, um, but people also just hunt them for sport, just like waterfowl maybe in this country. Um, so it's really, it depends on, um, yeah, the community that these people are living in and how they, how they use the resource. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question came in. Uh, do you know whether the uh, different breeding populations, Anchorage, Churchill, et cetera, are declining at different rates? Yeah, so we are, we do tend to see that the Alaska populations are declining more quickly than say Churchill or Eastern Canada for that matter. But the thing is, these estimates are mostly on road-based surveys and there are not a lot of roads in the areas where these birds breed. So those estimates, I don't know if I even necessarily trust them 100% just because, yeah, we aren't able to actually conduct surveys, an adequate number of surveys in areas where these birds are breeding. So that is definitely the next step is to try to get a better estimate of, of these populations um, as a whole. Uh, another question came in. What are the natural predators of these birds? That's a good question. Um, uh, two of the birds that we tagged were actually um, ended up getting killed about two weeks after we tagged them. 
and we found them on a steep cliff face in Eel River, which was likely due to some sort of raptor that had, had taken them. So raptors are definitely predators of these birds. Um, oh yeah, a Merlin falcon also got one in, in Mingan. The biologist out there let me know that this past year. So definitely um, hawks and falcons, those are the main predators. I was curious about um, their diet. I'm assuming since it's a shorebird, lots of marine, probably invertebrates. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we see them. So they try to match up. Seems like they're trying to match up the chick hatch time with when the dragonfly larvae are coming out, at least in Anchorage. That's mm -hmm. definitely a huge food source for these for the lesser yellows, especially the chicks, those young birds. They're eating a lot of larva, so. I don't want to alarm you, but there's an animal behind you. <laughs> yeah. just, just saying. Okay, any other questions? It is 7.51. We're coming to the end of our program. If you've got any other questions, please put them in the chat. Um, yeah. You Just said the life expectancy of the battery is about a year for the GPS. Is that right? Yeah. So it depends on how you schedule them. So I didn't go into that whole detail. That's a whole nother story in itself. But you basically schedule them ahead of time, make sure they're all the way charged up and put them on the bird. So you could collect locations every hour if you wanted to. You could collect them every day. For, for me, I really, um, I wanted to try to maximize the battery life. I wanted to be able to get those, those spring migrations. So um, for most birds, it's dependent on the location and a couple other things, but generally autumn migration, it collected a location every four days. And then during winter, it was less frequently. It was around between seven and 14 days since they were pretty stationary, didn't need as many locations. And then again, for spring migration, it was between um, two and four days. So we didn't get a location every single day, but I definitely did some modeling to try to estimate locations for each day and, and that worked out pretty well. So, yeah. Really um, I've, I've done some bird work myself and I know uh, some people kind of get a little worried about the bird wearing, you know, the, the glue and the, you know, the GPS collar, you know, it looks pretty rough being on that little bird, but um, can you tell us about, you know, how, what happens to that GPS monitor? Does it fall off when they molt or how does that work? Yeah, so that jewelry cord that I mentioned that we're using, it definitely breaks down from UV. Um, so they, they will fall off uh, after a couple of years. Uh, we did we did capture two birds in Anchorage that still had their GPS tags on them. And they definitely had some rubbing right under the tag um, where the feathers weren't necessarily growing very well. Um, but that was, that was the only issue we saw. And they seemed to be doing totally fine other than that. Um, we definitely wanted to try to catch birds and get those tags off if we could. We don't want to have to wear them any longer than they, than they do. So, yeah, we're definitely conscious of that. But the material breaks down, they fall off eventually. Awesome. Um, got a question. That, uh, are peregrine falcons predators of these birds? Yes. Yes, they are. I feel like peregrines kind of are predators of any bird. They're, <laughs> they're, they're just an efficient critter. Yep, we, we saw that first ha hand out on the coastal refuge one year. So yes, they are definitely a predator. <laughs> All right, uh, well, any last questions that you wanna put in the chat, go ahead and let's do that. Uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and thank our sponsors one last time before we say goodbye. Of course, we couldn't do this without them. Uh, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, the uh, United States Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Fisheries, the National Park Service, Alaska Conservation Foundation, Projects in Motion, and Alaska Geographic. And on that note, please, again, look in the chat for the 10% discount code 
The word is migrations uh, for a 10% uh, discount in their web store. Oh, and I forgot the gift bag, the bird themed gift bag. I did choose someone as you were speaking. I just scrolled really quickly and I stopped and I stopped on the name. Are you ready? John Elzinga. John Elzinga, you are the winner of the bird themed gift pack. You will receive an email from me, uh, hopefully by tomorrow. So congratulations to John Elzinga. All right, any other last questions before we say good night? I'll give a moment for people to type. <laughs> well, thank you, Laura, that was super great. Uh, I'm excited because spring is coming. Uh, you can feel it, you can see it out the window. It's still light. Um, I haven't heard any birds singing yet. I did hear a report of a junco uh, that was singing, but I haven't heard any, uh, you know, official bird songs yet myself, so. so. The chickadees are definitely singing a lot more. <laughs> the chickadees are definitely talking up a storm. That is true. <laughs> yes, yes, I do stand corrected. Uh, I'm waiting, of course, for my favorite, the very thrush. Uh, just maybe a couple of weeks, a couple of yep, weeks. Yeah, should be soon. Yep, those guys and the ruby crown kinglets. <laughs> Oh, I, I say I got goosebumps. I'm not even kidding. I love, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not joking. I wish I was joking. No, when you hear that Ruby crown, you're like, oh yes, summer, <laughs> summer is here. Yeah. Love it. Awesome. Well, I think that is going to be it for tonight. It looks like people are thanking you uh, for your presentation tonight. Thanks everyone. Oops. Thanks for everyone for coming uh, here tonight. Uh, and Laura, awesome presentation. So much good information. Uh, and for everyone else, uh, please tune in next month for uh, the next uh, Wildlife Wednesday presentation. Um, and, oh, I don't have it written down. It is the last Wednesday of April. I think it's April 23rd. Mm. 27th. Uh, 27th. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I don't have my calendar open. Anyway, please come back and see us for that. Again, thank you, Laura. Uh, it's been wonderful, and we'll see everyone later. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.